Hi, my name is Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote. This podcast has been brought to you by the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. To learn more, visit www.thecgo.org. Today, I'm talking with Daniel McLaughlin, a senior writer at the National Review. He, is, he was formerly an attorney practicing securities and commercial litigation in New York City, and among other things, he is a baseball blogger at BaseballCrank.com. Today, we're going to be unpacking the question of D.C. statehood, and we're going to be talking about the recent vote in the House of Representatives in favor of D.C. statehood and what that means. Welcome. Glad to be here. So before we start, I wanted to ask you a question that I ask all my guests, which is, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Um, I think I would say history, and, and I don't mean only broadly in terms of American history, although I think, you know, knowing American history is important. Um, I mean, I think, for example, if you're engaged in politics, uh, and this is true not only in politics in a lot of areas, but say if you're engaged in politics as I am, you know, I see a lot of, of young writers uh, and young reporters who are dealing frequently with people who are 40, you know, 40, 50 years older than them. And I think to understand those people and where they're coming from, you have to understand the political history of the time period that that those folks lived through that you didn't. Um, and, you know, I think it goes more broadly than that. When I was practicing law, I often tell, uh, you know, young lawyers, if you are working in a particular field of law, if you're looking at a particular question of law, you want to know the history. You want to know, you know, not just what are the rules, what does the statute say, what does the case law say, but how did it develop? Uh, you know, when did different things get passed and changed in the law and why, um, you know, what waves of litigation produced the case law, uh, the particular case law that you're relying on or that shifted the law? Uh, you know, not only what happened, but why did it happen? So I think, I think it is broadly true, not just in the simple history book sense, but in, in most anywhere that you're, that you're working uh, or laboring or learning to know the history. That's a really good answer. I like that. And that kind of relates almost exactly to what I was about to ask you next, which was um, how D.C. isn't a state like Virginia or like California. So what were the framers of the Constitution thinking? What did they have in mind when they designed the system the way they did? What is the context for D.C. not being a state? Right. And they they when they designed the Constitution, of course, they didn't know where the federal district was going to be. Uh, it was going to be carved out of one or more states, uh, and it was only a few years later that sort of a famous uh, deal involving Alexander Hamilton and, and perhaps Thomas Jefferson um, that they settled on exactly where it was going to be. They started out in New York. Um, but uh, essentially, the idea was that the capital would be its own federal district. You know, it the history derives from the fact that there was, you know, you had the Articles of Confederation um, in which the states were all equal um, and they had to be unanimous to do things and that didn't work very well. So at the Constitutional Convention, they were attempting to put the federal government in a greater position of power over the states, uh, but there was still concern, a lot of concern about, you know, the big states or particular states dominating the others. And so the idea was that there would be carved out a capital district uh, that would be physically under the control of the federal government uh, and that would not, uh, in fact, be dominated or controlled by a single state. In fact, one of the main reasons they moved the capital out of New York was uh, not so much a concern about physical domination of the capital by New York, but the simple fact that the government was on, literally on Wall Street. Uh, Hamilton lived on Wall Street. The federal government was on Wall Street, uh, and there was a lot of concern that just uh, both as a cultural matter and in terms of access to information, 
which in those days moved much faster down the street than it did, you know, down the eastern seaboard, um, that Wall Street traders had gained too much cultural control uh, and economic control over the federal government. So moving it was, you know, it was believed at the time that, that moving it south would give the south more power and authority. Uh, and, 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 you know, and as it turned out, um, it, you know, when you fast forward to uh, 1861 and the Civil War, the fact that the capital was so close to the front lines of the war, um, and in fact that the Confederates also placed their own capital in Richmond fairly close to the front lines, uh, that dictated a lot of the, a lot of the military strategy of the war. I didn't know, but I mean, I kind of knew about how the Confederate, like capital of Richmond kind of played a part in the role, but I never really thought about DC's role in that, which is interesting. Um, was DC meant, like when it was created as a district, was it meant to have people living there? Because it was moved to be away from business, especially Wall Street, as you said, but for ordinary people who weren't like big traders on Wall Street and stuff, was it meant to be just government? No, it was not really. I mean, they it was it was barely inhabited at the beginning, um, and it was still very very sparsely populated at the time of the Civil War. Uh, but uh, at least relative to you know any state, uh, Vermont at the time, which is now smaller than D.C. in population, but still like eight or ten times the population of D.C. Um, but, you know, it, when they, when, when LaFont laid out the plans for the city, they planned, I mean, they, they laid out roads, they laid out a much bigger space uh, than, they, than they had the people to populate it with. And, 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 of course, at the time, a good deal of the population right at the beginning and, and for many of the early decades was slaves, um, you know, and, 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 and they obviously did not choose to be there. Um, but you know, if you go back to the Federalist Papers and Madison is discussing what the federal government's seat will be like and the the characteristics of the federal district. Um, and at that time, he doesn't know geographically where it's going to be. He's writing for a New York audience, but he doesn't know uh, in 1788, uh, 1787, where the capital district is going to be. But he talks about the fact that, look, if you build this capital district, you're going to have buildings you're going to have, you know, perhaps fortifications, you're going to have bureaucracy, you're going to have all these permanent installations. And so once you create that, it will be hard to move. And that wasn't totally unprecedented. I mean, Russia had done something like that earlier, you know, but 70 or 80 years earlier when Peter the Great moved his capital from, um, you know, from Moscow to the brand new city of St. Petersburg, which was a planned city. And it was designed to be a capital city. Um, and, and so, you know, what the founders were doing was, was in some way similar to that. They were creating a planned city, but th they did expect that it would be a city. I want to talk about what you said a little bit about James Madison and kind of how him and other framers were kind of anxious about having too much power in DC because of the influence of the residents because it, it was the home of the government. In Federalist 43, James Madison wrote that, quote, the gradual accumulation of public improvements at the stationary residence of the government would be both too great a public pledge to be left in the hands of a single state and would create so many obstacles to, remove, to a removal of the government as still further to abridge its necessary independence, end quote. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning also that 25% of the um, residents of D.C. work for the federal government in some capacity. So can you break down what Madison was saying when he said that? Yeah, and it's, it, I don't think it's actually 25% of the residents of D.C. necessarily, but there's one, one federal job in D.C. for, all four, for, for every four residents. So it's because obviously, you know, a good deal of those live currently in uh, surrounding Virginia and Maryland. But it is, uh, it is a very high, even the residents, I think, is a pretty high percentage uh, employed by the federal government. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, the, the ties to Virginia and Maryland have also had a big impact, you know, particularly in recent decades on Virginia and Maryland politics. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, Madison recognized that when you're talking about, um, you know, talking about influence, I mean, the founders, again, you're, you're, you're looking back there to an era before railroads, before steamboats, before the telegraph, um, let alone our, you know, more modern uh, technologies. And so place was a very important thing to them. Uh, where you, you know, uh, the old saying about, you know, where you sit is where you stand. Um, you know, they recognized that, that the people who were in immediate communication on a daily basis with the federal government, the people who lived right around where the federal government was, would have quite a lot of influence. Um, and, that, you know, they understood how, how this worked in France in particular, where, um, you know, that the people in Paris just had a disproportionate influence compared to the countryside. Uh, and the same is true in London. Um, you know, and, and, and obviously part of the, col the colonists' concerns that led them to rebel was the sense that they were so distant, uh, they were so far away from London that they didn't have, you know, they didn't, not only did they not have formal representation, but they just didn't really have a voice that could get regularly heard in the, the precincts of power in London. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to talk about um, the way that the framers designed voting for DC and electoral representation. So how are DC rep how are DC residents represented in the House and the Senate if they are at all and how are they represented in presidential elections? Well, they're more represented now than they were at the founding. Um because originally DC had essentially no control whatsoever. Right. It had no representation in Congress. It had no representation in presidential elections. And Congress was uh, under Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, given absolutely plenary authority for lawmaking over D.C. Congress has greater control over D.C. law than it has over any other part of the country. It has powers there that it does not have uh, in the states. And it has even arguably broader powers than it has in the territories. Um, that has changed over time. Uh, in the late 1950s and around 19, the time of the 1960 presidential election, um, uh, President Eisenhower and the presidential candidates for both parties, Kennedy and Nixon, all supported uh, giving D.C. a voice in presidential elections. Um, and so they supported what they supported passed into law is the 23rd Amendment. Uh, which the Constitution needed to be amended to do this. And it gave D.C. Um, a representation of three electoral votes uh, in the Electoral College. Basically, it's, it, D.C. is allowed to have the same number of votes in the Electoral College that it would have if it was a state, with the proviso that it can't have more than the smallest state. Um, and so that has always remained at three electoral votes. Uh, because we still, you know, the smallest states still have three electoral votes. Um, D.C. does not have any representation even today in the Senate. In, I guess it was in the 1970s, a couple of things happened. Um, first, Congress gave D.C. home rule, uh, which it had done before briefly, and it had failed disastrously, uh, you know, I think the 1870s. But uh, home rule basically means that most of D.C.'s local government is now elected by the people of D.C. Um, but Congress still has the authority to override D.C. law, um, but it, it has essentially granted by congressional statute um, control of D.C. Uh, to the D.C. residents. Um, in Congress, what also happened is that they, they, gave, they gave D.C. a representative in the House. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton has now been there for, for I think, 34 years. Um, and uh, she is, you know, she has an office, she sits in hearings and all of that, but she does not have a vote. Um, so D.C. residents are allowed to elect someone to, to the House, but she has no power. So then what's the point? Well, it it's not completely pointless, obviously. She does get, you know, there is, again, that 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 simple fact of having someone who is there, someone who can ask questions, someone who can talk to people. But it, 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 is, mm -hmm. it is very far from the influence that you have if you're able to elect someone who has a vote, uh, who can exercise power. 
And last week, the House of Representatives voted nearly almost like almost completely along party lines to grant statehood to DC, which is the first time a chamber of Congress has approved establishing the nation's capital as a state. Can you tell us what the most common arguments are in favor of DC coming a state? And what is your take on these arguments? So you have to start with the fact, of course, that DC is completely and has been for all of living memory, completely dominated by the Democratic Party. So the the background of all of these arguments is, of course, the Democrats have a um, pure self-interest in D.C. statehood, and Republicans have a pure self-interest in opposing D.C. statehood. And so, you know, a lot of the arguments that are made are really driven by that, by simple power politics, which have a particular resonance today because, you know, the presidency is so divided. The Senate is so divided. Um, you know, control of the House can be very closely divided. Um, so that's the background. But I, th I think in general, the arguments over D.C. statehood, um, I mean, the, the principal argument and theoretical argument in favor of D.C. statehood, of course, is simply the idea that, look, people who live in D.C. are American citizens. Uh, they ought to be represented in the government uh, because they pay federal taxes. Um, and, you know, it, no taxation without representation is literally on their, on their license plates. Uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that there have been territories, territory, in addition to not having the federal district, there have been territories um, in the United States that did not have representation in Congress or the presidency uh, all the way back to 1783. There have always been territories, uh, and there are still other territories besides D.C. So the idea that everybody who is an American citizen gets a vote at every level of government just says it, it hasn't historically actually been the case. Uh, and I don't think anybody is proposing, say, to make Guam a state, uh, you know, or some of the other uh, island, small, fairly sparsely t populated island territories. Um, Puerto Rico is a whole different uh, kettle of fish, obviously, because it's, it's, it's a nation, it's a, a territory of a couple of million people. But um, so that's, that's the high level argument. But the chief are two categories of arguments about D.C. statehood. One is about the nature of D.C. and its people, right? Because D.C. now has, you know, for a long time it was smaller than any state. It's now larger than, than two states in population, Vermont and Wyoming. Um, but it is still smaller than the other 48 states. It is physically smaller uh, by far than any state. Um, and you know, there is some concern sometimes raised over the fact that this is a city. It's not a, you know, it's not sort of a, it, it, the urban rural balance that you get in most states. Um, a major part of the concern about the population of D.C. Uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago was that the city was basically poor and an economic basket case. Uh, that is not true at all now. Um, it has a higher median income than any state. Um, so D.C. is, you know, the idea that D.C. could not possibly be self-sufficient without the federal subsidies that come from being the capital district is no longer necessarily the case. Um, you know, there is also, I think, a subtext of race here. Uh, D.C., um, you know, down to about the 70s and 80s, had an enormously growing uh, black population and a declining white population to the point where you know, as recently as about 1980, it was about 70% black. And so, you know, there, there has been, and, and I think continues to be even today, and a current of argument that it is a particular racial injustice for D.C. alone uh, on the continental United States to not have representation. Um, at the same time, the demographics of the city have shifted. Uh, it, it ceased to be majority black about two or three years ago. Uh, although the city still has, I think, a higher African-American population percentage-wise than Mississippi, which is the, uh, the state in the union which has the highest black population. So, you know, there are arguments that relate to particularly the territory of D.C., but the other set of arguments are about the particular federal nature of D.C., the fact that it is the capital. And I think that is where the stronger arguments are against D.C. statehood. Uh, the concerns that we talked about earlier, you know, Madison's concern about 
cultural dominance, uh, economic dominance of the federal government simply by it, the proximity of D.C. and its residents. And I think that's particularly true as the federal government has grown enormously as all of these federal jobs are in D.C. And the other concern is about the physical security of uh, the federal government. And, and I think that a lot of that has come to the fore just in the last several weeks where we had, um, you know, the clashes between the D.C. government and the president over the use of federal force uh, to protect statues and parks and, and the physical perimeter of the White House uh, and the, uh, the D.C. mayor arguing that, that President Trump was using too much force uh, and, and should not have been doing some of the things he was doing. And whether or not you agree with him and whether or not you agree with her, I think there is a real concern that if you had, uh, you know, the entirety of D.C. turned over to, um, you know, a state government, and that state government was politically at odds with uh, the president or Congress, um, that its control over the streets, its control over the security of the area, uh, could become a lever to basically back the president or Congress or the, or the Supreme Court, for that matter, uh, into doing things that they might not otherwise do, and therefore using that as, as leverage over the federal government's power over the rest of the country. Kind of back to when you were saying that at the base, it's kind of a, it's more self-interest of like Democrat versus Republican in this sort of a vote. If the city was a Republican stronghold, I think, I mean, this is just me just thinking based off of like how people voted because it was two, it was 232 to 180 with all Republicans and one Democrat saying no to DC statehood. I think that if it were switched and if the city were a Republican stronghold, then Republicans would support DC statehood and Democrats would be against it. But I'm, not entirely sure. That's just my thoughts. But I don't um, know. Yeah, I don't know that that would be true for every single person in Congress. But I have no. I, I, I completely agree with that. That if if you know political actors make decisions for political motives, it's not surprising, and it's not new. Um, I think if you look at you know certainly the period before the Civil War, uh, statehood discussions were were often dominated by the free state slave state balance. Um, you know, if you look at uh, when Benjamin Harrison was president and, and the country was very, very closely politically divided between Republicans and Democrats at the time, and Harrison and the Republican Congress ran through six new states. Uh, and they did so for fairly, I mean, obviously they had reasons as people had reasons at other times, but but their political motives were fairly naked. Um, it actually did not save Harrison from losing the next election. Three of the six new states voted for a third party candidate. Uh, but the Republicans thought at the time that they could stack the Senate and the Electoral College. Uh, and I think if you look at, at Alaska and Hawaii statehood, at the time in 1959, there was a widespread perception that they would be balanced. One would be Republican, one would be Democrat. Um, I think people at the time got wrong which would be which. But the idea of balance meant that there was political horse trading and it was not just a pure benefit for one side and a pure downside for the other. Mm -hmm. I've read in a lot of places that a vote for D.C. statehood is symbolic more than anything else and that it doesn't really have a chance to go anywhere. And I assume that it would require more stuff like, you know, an amendment to the Constitution, which hasn't happened very many times, so can you talk about reasons why this is not going anywhere, why it probably won't turn out with D.C. being a state? Yeah, I mean, it's it's two problems. One is, of course, you have to get both to admit a new state. You have to get both houses of Congress and the president to sign off. And because this is a matter of pure political upside for one party and pure political downside for the other, that's not going to happen until you have unified democratic control. But there's an additional step, which is that because of the unique constitutional status of the federal district set forth in you know, Article 1, Section 8, and in the 23rd Amendment, um, there's no question that creating 
a new that it, eliminating the federal district uh, and creating a new state uh, would absolutely require a constitutional amendment, and then you need you know uh, you need you need a whole lot of states to vote for that, and that's that's going to include a lot of states controlled by Republicans that have no political incentive uh, to do that. Now, there's a variety of other ways you could approach this to try to carve off some of the territory of D.C. and turn that into a state or or give it back to uh, perhaps be reincorporated in Maryland, because uh, part of the original area of D.C. Uh, has already been given back in 1846 to Virginia, because uh, it was originally carved out of Maryland and Virginia, and what's left is now almost entirely the land they took from Maryland. Um, so there are other ways that you could turn some of D.C. into a new state without amending the Constitution, but to, uh, among other things, that would have the strange impact, though, that if you if you basically put all the people of D.C. into a brand new state without changing the Constitution, then D.C. itself would still have those three electoral votes and almost nobody voting for them, and that would be strange. Mm -hmm. And... I have to say, I really understand, like, I mean, to some extent, why people in D.C. who are not as politically motivated want to be represented in Congress, why demographics matter and stuff like that. You wrote a fascinating article over at the National Review that asked the question, quote, but what if compromise were possible and whether there are other ways to give D.C. residents more electoral powers. You offer three alternatives, which I would like us to go over, and you've kind of mentioned one of them, which is a, retro a retrocession into Maryland, which has to do with giving land back and stuff like that. So can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so one solution, as I said, is a partial retrocession to Maryland, which is... Um, you could, uh, without changing the Constitution, you could carve off uh, a big chunk of the area that people actually live in in D.C., reduce the scale of the federal district uh, to much more the area immediately around, you know, the Mall, the White House, Capitol, Supreme Court. Uh, and so most of, the, most of the actual residents of D.C. would become Maryland residents. Um, and as I said, that would have the downside of the fact that that you would still have this, uh, what remains of the federal district would still have three votes for president. Um, but it, it, that would be the simplest solution in a lot of ways. It would make Maryland more powerful. Uh, it would probably be resisted by some people in Maryland who might not necessarily want D.C., although, again, I think that resistance would have been much greater at the time when D.C. was in terrible economic condition and you know, I mean, 30 years ago, Maryland residents really did not want to be stuck putting the bill for D.C., whereas now D.C. would be seen more as an economic asset. Um, so that's that's the simplest solution. Uh, for Democrats, it would be somewhat disappointing because they wouldn't get any more power in the Senate, uh, but they would get a little more power in the House. Um, and because Maryland's size would expand, they would get a little more extra power in the Electoral College. Um, the second possibility uh, would be uh, essentially to, which would require a constitutional amendment as well as the consent of the Virginia state government, would be to expand D.C. statehood by adding in uh, portions that were retroceded back to Virginia and maybe even a larger chunk of northern Virginia. Um, and the reason that would be politically perhaps more palatable is that, you know, Northern Virginia is, it's very economically tied to D.C. It's, it's um, you know, it's very liberal. Uh, it's, it's largely urban uh, or suburban. It, it would fit with D.C. politically and culturally. Um, and it would also reduce the power of Democrats greatly in Virginia. It would, Virginia has shifted, you know, it was a safe Republican state. From uh, for for decades up until the mid 2000s, and it has become a safe democratic state now. Um, it would suddenly become much more competitive for Republicans because of their uh, base in the you know rural south and west of the state. Um, and so that's a solution that would at least offer something to both sides politically. 
Um, but again, because and perhaps because you could amend that you have to amend the Constitution to fully carry this out, you could eliminate the uh, three electoral votes for the federal district. Um, the third solution would be, um, and this also I think would require a constitutional amendment, the third solution would be to, instead of turning D.C. into a state, keep D.C. as a um, federal district, but give its residents more or less dual citizenship in Maryland so that they could vote for Maryland senators, they could vote for Maryland's governor, they could have representation in the House of Representatives uh, within, you know, as more or less Maryland uh, members of Congress. Um, you know, and again, you could possibly, with a constitutional amendment, you could, you could achieve this and possibly remove the three electoral votes from Maryland. Uh, this, again, would be something that would increase the power of the Democrats in the House, uh, increase their it would probably be kind of a wash for them in the electoral college. I think they would lose perhaps a vo two votes um, because you know adding DC residents would expand Maryland, but then you're removing the free electoral votes from DC. Uh, it would not give uh, it would not change the calculus in the Senate, which of course is a major worry of Republicans. So I think this is actually one of the more I, I think either of those last two solutions would be the more politically palatable to Republicans, I think this solution of kind of dual citizenship would be a little easier to do because you wouldn't have to get the permission of Virginia, right? Because Virginia's government being run by Democrats now uh, would probably be very resistant to having some of their land stripped away and, and added to a different state. You concluded your article by saying, quote, as usual, creative thinking isn't really on the table right now. But if the proponents of D.C. statehood are sincere about not just seeking a partisan power grab, there are other ways they could go to offer a deal and stop, think and stop tilting at windmills, end quote. So what I'm sensing in this is that you're not really hopeful about creative thinking in this area, right? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we uh, over the last uh, 13 years or so, we've really gotten into a rut in Washington where, you know, partisan division in Washington has been escalating for decades. Um, but, you know, I think we've kind of crossed uh, a series of lines where it is harder and harder to get each side to sit down and cut deals. You know, you shouldn't, you should be able to cut a deal uh, with somebody you disagree with as long as you get something for your side and they get something for theirs. You, it doesn't have to be a matter of you know, loving each other or compromising your principles, you just recognize that horse trading is valuable. Um, and I think we've kind of gotten away from that. Congress in general has gotten out of the habit of passing laws or even passing budgets. Um, and it's just, you know, the dynamics for a variety of reasons have made it easier to get reelected by telling people that you're never, ever going to cut a deal with the other side rather than going home to your district and saying, hey, I cut this deal and, and we got something that was valuable out of it. Um, and, you know, I think the, uh, I mean, obviously, I think I think President Trump has not been uh, a great help to that, partly just because of how much, uh, you know, how, how much the, the emotional intensity has been raised between him and, and his opponents on the Democratic side, and also just because he's not really a very, sort of, for all his deal-making, talk. He's not really a very policy-oriented guy, so he hasn't really been as focused on trying to prod Congress uh, into changing its ways. Uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different structural and individual and partisan causes to this, but the net result is that, you know, sitting down and saying, why don't I give you this and you give me that, and we both get something we want, and neither one of us has, has to swallow something we can't possibly tolerate, I think that spirit in Washington deal making has kind of gone away, and uh, I don't know when exactly it's going to come back. Is there anything you would like to add to the issue of statehood that we have not covered yet? Uh, no, I mean I think we've I think we've pretty much covered the waterfront. Okay, that sounds that sounds good to me. Um, what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on, and why? Um, I mean, I think I've kind of gone back and forth on a fair number of issues. You know, I, actually, I'm gonna 
I'm going to pick something totally off politics here in a way, um, which is that I w finally went back as an adult and read The Great Gatsby, uh, which I had to read in high school and hated. Uh, and I hated it because I thought at the time that it was this book that was really just sort of glamorizing these, you know, uh, what I saw at the time as kind of horrible, snobby, rich people, and, and that was just why people liked the book. Uh, and, and I went back and read it as an adult uh, with a different perspective and, and watched the movie versions of it uh, and, and came to a different view on that and, and really came to understand what the, book, what the book's message was that I, I think I didn't get when I was 15. So um, I guess if there's a lesson there, it's that you know, all the, 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 the terrible things uh, that you get assigned to read or that you think are terrible in, in school, in high school, in college, and grammar school, Sometimes those things really are terrible, but some of them, some of them actually, you just have to go back with the eyes of an adult and, and read them later on. That's, I think that's really good. I like that. I mean, I've found that to be true, even of stuff I read like five years ago when I was in middle school. Like, I'm trying to think, we had to read, I don't know, so many things that I just could not stand. I was like, these are ridiculous. Why would we read them? But then I read them again and I was like, oh, this actually is like relevant and makes sense. And even just a few years kind of changed my perspective. So I'm going to keep that in mind. That's thank you. And thank you so much for talking to me about this. This is such an interesting topic and very relevant too. Um, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>